so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains graphic depictions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. It's 1888 and a man who will become perhaps the most infamous serial killer in history is terrorising the streets of London. Fog rises from the damp streets of the Whitechapel district, a largely impoverished area which has earned itself a reputation for being a cauldron of immorality. Poverty, racism, hundreds of lodging houses which function as brothels and social unrest means that the slums in the east end of London have already earned themselves a reputation. It's September 10 and five killings have taken place within one and a half kilometres of each other in just over a month. All the victims are women. The culprit is known as Jack the Ripper because of the horrifically brutal nature of his violent crimes. A number of letters were sent from a man claiming to be the killer, taunting police and journalists. One of the letters purported to have been sent from hell. To this day, the killer's identity is unknown. But there's a theory that he might have been a man named Frederick Deeming, a man who eventually ended up in Australia. I'm Jesse Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist Gary Linnell. His book, The Devil's Work, looks back at the life and crimes of Frederick Deeming, the man known throughout the US, England and Australia as the criminal of the century. I want to start with a woman named Anne Deeming who was pregnant with her fourth child and sensed that this child might be different. Why was that and can you describe the dynamic of the family? The Deeming family, they come from a very varied background. There's a suggestion that a lot of them worked in the coal mines in Lancashire back in the 1840s and 1850s, and they'd had a uh, a very long, bad run of luck. But conditions in those coal mines back then were absolutely atrocious. And they had children as young as seven and eight going deep underground and pulling uh, large carts of coal, bringing it back to the surface. And it wasn't until the 1850s and 1860s that there was an outcry and they changed that. The Deeming family, we believe Frederick was born in 1853. As you said, he was their fourth child and Anne was a very religious person. She uh, read the Bible to her children all of the time. Unfortunately, the man that she was married to had a, uh, what we would call these days, a really bad mental condition. He felt that one of the homes that they were living in was haunted. He believed that there were spirits uh, walking around on the floorboards that he could hear at night. And he had seemed to take an instant dislike to the baby that his wife was carrying, young Frederick. By the time he was born, her husband left her and the children, and she had to sort of sell up the home and go searching for him right throughout Middle England to try and track him down. They were reunited eventually, and they went on to have seven children. But Frederick, the fourth boy, he just couldn't get along with his father. The father beat him mercilessly, really took out of his frustrations. And the father was also one of these tormented, tortured souls who threatened to kill himself on several occasions. And the young boys, and Frederick was uh, as young as seven and eight at one stage, had to wrestle a scalpel away from him to stop him from cutting his own throat. So those were the sort of conditions that young Frederick Deeming grew up in, protected by his mother very heavily very close to her. And then when she died, it seemed to have a really significant effect on him. He believed that he saw his mother's ghost floating outside the window once. And then to get away from his father and his father's beatings, he took to the sea. The family were then living near the Mersey River near Liverpool. There were boats coming back and forth all the time. And by the time he was 13 and 14, he was going away to sea for months at a time. And every time he came home, his older brothers noticed a really significant change in him. He was becoming more and more eccentric. He clearly aspired 
to be uh, someone of a higher class than the working class Lancashire family that he came from. And he'd wear medals, he'd wear expensive jewellery, he'd put on a top hat and a long coat, and he'd talk to himself a lot. These were the sort of problems that the Deeming family began to encounter with Fred, or they called him Mad Fred, because they just never knew what he was going to get up to or when he would return home. He was also a serial bigamist throughout his life, but his first wife was Marie. What do we know about their relationship? A a very tortured relationship, I think. Remember, it's back in the uh, 1870s and 1880s when they first get married. Marie is a Welsh girl from a small Welsh village. She's gone to England to become a cook, and she's supposed to be one of the best cooks in Britain, according to some of her friends. Her uh, sister has married one of Frederick's brothers, and I think that's how they meet. They get married, and Frederick promises to take her around the world with him because he's now an experienced uh, traveller. So they end up going out to Australia. Frederick goes first. He arrives in Sydney, gets a job as a gas fitter and a plumber, and she soon joins him after that. As you said, he's a serial bigamist. He's attracted to women. It's an addiction. He can't help himself. He's always proposing marriage to other women. Once they're in Sydney, Marie falls pregnant and she's stuck at home. She ends up having three kids in Australia with him. While he's out on the tiles every night, he's proposing to barmaids. He's a thief as well as a con man. He's stealing jewellery left, right and centre and handing it over to these barmaids. And he has a horse and a cart that sort of take him around town at night. And his eccentric ways sort of continue. She has to put up with it. It's the 1880s. There's not much she can actually do. There's no pension for women who have separated for their husbands. She has to rely on him. And I don't think there's any doubt that she knew what he was up to on the side, but I think she just chose, unfortunately, like a lot of women had to back then, to look the other way. Was he popular with women? Because you were saying that, you know, he was attracted to women and he was constantly courting women, but was he successful? He seemed to be. He seemed to be staging several affairs at once. And there were sort of two or three barmaids in Sydney that he was said to be going out with. Some of them had a feeling that there was something quite not right with him. I tell you what, you'd have to have something wrong with you, I think, not to be able to detect that, the way that he acted. He had a very large tumbling uh, moustache. Now, moustaches were quite common in the era, but his was extraordinary. It's like a theatre curtain that sort of fell over his, tumbled over his lips And he was very proud of this. And he used to go around boasting about this, about his masculinity all the time. He always seemed to be wanting to prove something. And yet there were certainly enough women who seemed to be attracted to him to, you know, fall for his various alibis that he used to come up with and his disguises as well. He went around the world using a whole bunch of aliases at last count We think he used over 20 aliases during his crime spree that sort of went over about three decades. And I guess it culminated when he was finally captured and uh, his Supreme Court trial took place in Melbourne. The reporters there and the barristers were struck by the amount of young women who sought out tickets so they could actually sit in the front row and be up close to him. And to me, it's a little bit like the phenomenon that we've seen over the years, I guess, with some women who have written to prisoners on death row in various countries and who sometimes even marry prisoners that they've never actually met, that they've just struck up a correspondence with. And this was the subject of a a lot of debate, both in Melbourne and Sydney at the time. But Frederick, I mean, you wouldn't say he was the best looking bloke around, but he certainly seemed to have something charismatic about him that attracted women to him. As you say, he travelled a lot. He was always going to different countries and on different ships. It was the late 1880s when London first learned of Jack the Ripper. What had this man done? How did he become known in London? Well, Jack the Ripper, probably the greatest cold case unsolved murder mystery in the world, isn't it? And it's still ongoing. There are thousands of people around the world at the moment who still devote much of their time to trying to figure out who actually did it. Now, we'll probably never quite know, but in the autumn of 1888, at least five women, and in the years to come, up to 11, weren't just murdered, they were horribly butchered. And it was the uh, ferocity of these attacks that really uh, became quite sensational in London at that time. It sent shockwaves through the city. London was the largest city the world had ever known. There were more than five million people crammed into its precincts. 
as you can imagine, you've probably seen the cliched images over the years of these frog-filled, mist-filled alleyways and streets, men with long overcoats, large top hats, all of them sort of walking along moodily, smoking cigars. It was like that. You know, there were so many coal fires being burned in the city, so much horse dung. I think I said in the book it's about a 1,000 tonnes of horse dung that were dropped on the streets every day. It was quite a disgusting area. And Whitechapel was one of the poorest precincts in London. There were a lot of women there who, you know, became popular, I think, that the victims of Jack the Ripper were actually street workers or prostitutes. They weren't. There's a lot of evidence that at least four out of the five key victims were just homeless women. Look, they may have worked from time to time on the streets just to get enough money so that they could put a a roof over their head at night, but they certainly weren't regular street workers or street walkers. That's kind of part of the mythology that's built up around Jack the Ripper. The brutal attacks, the way that their bodies were slashed, internal organs were taken out and placed around the vicinity of the crime. It horrified people. They'd never seen something as brutal as this. And by then, you also had the beginning of what would become probably the mass media. London had more than a dozen daily newspapers. The pressure was on there to sensationalise and and sell their stories and sell more copies of the papers. So when Jack the Ripper came along in the autumn of 1888, it wasn't a pretty sight, but it was certainly a goldmine for the local newspapers. Did investigators or those newspapers at the time ever speculate about what Jack the Ripper's motive might have been, why he was targeting these women? Yeah, there was a lot of talk back then that he had a pathological hatred for women and that he may have been a sufferer of a disease that back in those days, the newspapers couldn't even come to sort of print the word syphilis. And, you know, it was obviously a contagious disease. There wasn't really a cure back then. And part of the uh, effects of syphilis on the brains of some of its sufferers was a pathological hatred for those who had given it to them. Also, the methodical way that some of the bodies had been butchered. One of the police surgeons came out and said that he believed that it required someone with extensive medical knowledge because of the way they'd been able to locate the internal organs as well. We had all of this going on. And then later on, you know, we'll discover that Frederick Deeming may well have been in London at the time of those murders and was showing quite a keen interest in them as well. So on that, what's the case for Frederick potentially being Jack the Ripper? Because his name has come up and he's one of the people that historians have linked to these crimes. Yeah, certainly. Look, the methodology behind his murders were very different. We'll probably get into that in a minute. He buried his bodies. He hid them from view, whereas Jack the Ripper was more than happy to have them displayed out in the open, whether or not they were inside or outdoors. But there is a young dressmaker, a young girl, who said that she was in Whitechapel in that autumn of 1888, and she was being courted by a man who called himself Harry Lawson. Now, Harry Lawson was one of the uh, famous aliases that Frederick Deeming used over the years, and he matched the exact description. There was only ever one key witness to one of the Jack the Ripper killings, and they reported that the killer, or the man they suspected was the killer, had a large moustache, and a fair ginger moustache and fair hair as well. And this certainly matched the description of Frederick Deeming. We also believe that he had been corresponding with one of the victims, uh, I think Catherine Eddowes, who was the third or fourth victim of Jack the Ripper in that period, and he may well have been swapping letters with her. So there's enough circumstantial evidence to at least put him within the three or top five suspects, I would have thought, in the Jack the Ripper case. What did Frederick ultimately do to his wife, Marie, and their four children? Yeah, well, he took them, they had to escape. They had to leave Sydney because he'd been bankrupt and he got into an awful lot of trouble. They changed their names and they booked themselves on a ship to South Africa. And to him, South Africa was a great lure. They had a lot of great diamond mines operating back then and a man could make a large fortune in a very small amount of time. So they went off there. It's a very dark period in his life. We don't know what he'd quite get up to, but we do know that he arrived back in England in 1889 with a, a cub lion at his feet, and he claimed to have rescued this cub lion from a a battle where he'd fought hand-to-hand these two lions in a cave and killed them with his bare hands. That was typical of Frederick Deeming, to go around telling outrageously false stories like that. He uh, 
went on the loose again. He left his wife and kids near Liverpool and he ended up in the city of Hull where he proposed to another young girl, the daughter of a widow, and she accepted it. They got married. And then on their honeymoon, they just got back to Hull and he left her alone in the hotel room and said he was just popping out for a shave, went off, jumped on a ship and headed off to Uruguay because the authorities were starting to pursue him for some jewels that he'd stolen. He was eventually recaptured, taken back, put in prison for nine months. And when he got out, he arrived at the English village of Rainhill and his first wife turned up with the four children. And he told locals in Rainhill that it was his sister and her children. They were only staying for a short time. Meanwhile, he was wooing another young woman, Emily Mather, who he would soon marry. His so-called sister and the four children disappeared and were never seen again. And we know now that he murdered them. He cut their throats and strangled one of his children and then buried all four bodies beneath the kitchen of this rented villa in Rainhill. Several layers of uh, heavy cement were put over the top and concrete blocks as well. He then married another girl in Rainhill. Immediately, he and uh, his new wife took off for Australia again. And they arrived in Australia in uh, late 1891. And on Christmas morning, in the early hours probably, we think, on uh, 1891, he murdered her as well, cut her throat, caved her head in with an axe, and buried her beneath the hearthstone of a fireplace in the second bedroom of a rented house in the suburb of Windsor in Melbourne. He then uh, immediately left town, got on a ship, went up to Sydney, met a young girl on that ship and proposed marriage to her as well. She was a bit hesitant. He insisted that she marry him, that she was the great love of his life. He told her he'd never been married before. She said, well, look, why don't we both make a fresh start? We'll go to Western Australia. And there was a mining town over there called Southern Cross, which was in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It was a real hole of a place. And even gold fussickers didn't even like staying there. They said there were just woolly willies of dust that used to just come through the town and upend everything all the time. He agreed. He said, okay, I'll meet you in Southern Cross. And by March 1892, he was sitting in a small house in that village. He'd become an engineer at one of the uh, Southern Cross gold mines. And there was a knock on the door and the police arrived and arrested him for the murder of his wife back in Melbourne. Her body had just been discovered. That then sort of led to the discovery of the body of his first wife and four children over in England. And it was quite an astonishing spectacle not just Australia, but the rest of the world, was gripped by the case. You have the New York Times on page one running stories day after day about it. The London newspapers were obsessed with the case. There were thousands of people gathered on the streets of Melbourne trying to get tickets in for the inquest and then the four-day trial that followed. This was quite an extraordinary case, and you had all manner of people sort of converging on the Supreme Court. I know on the first day that his trial began, they thought there were up to 15,000 people on a wet day gathered on the footpath outside, all of them trying to get a glimpse. There's nothing really that uh, you could really compare with it in the modern era, apart from some of those mass murder trials that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years in the United States. Mm. Did he confess when he was confronted by police and then put on trial? No, absolutely not. He denied it for a long time. One of the things about Frederick Deeming, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, right? But he was a man with a lot of cunning and a lot of street smarts about him. One of the things that really captivated me about this case was how it sort of saw the collision of, you know, the sleuths, the detectives who had to track him down, but it also brought into the case spiritualism, which is you know a quasi-religious movement that has started in America in the 1850s and swept around the world. And Frederick, I think, cunningly decided to tell a lot of people that he couldn't help it. He'd gone out and killed women because the ghost of his dead mother used to come to him at two o'clock every morning and urge him to kill because none of the women that he was with ever quite matched her expectations. Now, this was a ploy that suited him because his barrister who defended him at his Supreme Court trial was a future Prime Minister of Australia. His name was Alfred Deakin. He would become our second Prime Minister and he would be the architect of Australia's constitution as well. But Alfred Deakin had been a long-time spiritualist. When he was 16 years old, he believed he could control other people simply by sending messages from his mind. He was a Sunday school teacher at a spiritualist movement, and one of his young students was a young girl called Patty, 
who he would marry when she turned 18, and she was a medium, a spirit medium. She would host seances at their home on Saturday nights, and many times she claimed to be in contact with the dead, and they would pass on their messages to those still living through her handwriting. It was quite an extraordinary time. It was the second industrial revolution. So you had the electric light bulb was finally beginning to light up the world. You had motor cars on the way. You had the phonograph, this great contraption that could record voices. You had Alexander Graham Bell. His telephone was just being installed in many of the businesses, both in Australia and around the world. It was no longer a big place, the world. You know, it was starting to get smaller and smaller. Communications were so much quicker than they had been 10, 15 years earlier. And so a lot of people had turned away from traditional religion and spiritualism offered them this great get out. It said to them, listen, when you die, there's an afterlife and you can still sort of stay in touch with your loved ones. And so you you had Alfred Deacon, who was a believer in this. You had Marshall Lyle, who was deeming solicitor. He was also a spiritualist as well. There were people on the jury who were no doubt spiritualists as well. People would get together on a Saturday night in their dining rooms in their parlours and some would play cards but most of them would stage a seance you know they'd go and get out the widgie board it was a lot better than scrabble board and they'd sit around and sort of uh, get in touch with the spirits of the dead it's a very gothic richly gothic tale i think of uh, society sort of at the crossroads and spiritualism was kind of restricted largely to the middle class and the upper class. It wasn't a a thing that the working class dallied with that much. They didn't have that much time to worry about things like that. But certainly it captivated the wealthy and the influential. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jesse Stevens. I'm speaking with author Gary Linnell about his book, The Devil's Work. You tell an incredible story in the book about another woman who actually claims to have seen Deeming's dead mother as well and almost be haunted by her. What was her experience? Look, so many people had so many experiences, but the character that I fell in love with in the book was Sidney Dickinson. He was the New York Times correspondent, and he was a fantastic character. He was an art professor. He had toured the world with this magical instrument called the stereo opticon and that was a magic lantern and what it would do it had two lenses on it and would project images onto a wall and he might uh, give a lecture on art to three or four thousand people at any one time gathered at the local town hall he'd show an image and then the machine would dissolve that image and show another one it was a kind of a precursor to the motion pictures that were you know not very far away he was married to a lady called marion And Marion Dickinson was a firm spiritualist. She had conducted seances at their home back in Boston. She was quite well known among the upper class and the literary set in America. She was also a palm reader. And when they arrived in Melbourne in about 1889, she instantly set herself out to become a key figure in society. And uh, anyway, when uh, Frederick Deeming had been found guilty of the murders, he pleaded insanity and obviously the jury failed to uh, be convinced of that, and they sentenced him to death. The colony of Victoria was so embarrassed by the scandalous nature of the trial that they decided to hang him within three weeks of the trial. There was hardly an appeal staged at all. And so Sidney and his wife, Marion, were allowed to go in and see Frederick about four days before he was hanged. And Marion took a box of plaster in with her, and she mixed it up with water and passed it through the bars of the cell, And Frederick looked at it and placed his hand in the plaster, the wet plaster, and they were able to take a print of his hand and his arm so that they could later look at the lines in his hands and determine, you know, whether or not he was an instinctive criminal who'd been destined for a life of crime. And also to look at, you know, his past. She believed she could read anyone's past by looking at the palm. But she did say to her husband, finally, a few days after that meeting, that as they uh, sat talking, she could see Frederick Deeming's mother sitting in the back of the cell. She was exactly as Frederick had described her. She was an old hag who was always screaming and and telling him off. And this had been his trick right throughout his time in jail, that he used to wake up at two o'clock in the morning screaming like anything, saying that the ghost of his dead mother was uh, in his cell. Marion Dickinson claimed to her husband that she could always see dead people around them, 
They were living in a rented home in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. After that visit to see Frederick Deeming, strange things began to take place in that house. A lot of their possessions would be picked up and hurled around by unseen forces. She told Sydney that uh, in their living room, she could see a young girl, the ghost of a young girl sitting in the corner, just singing to herself. And even as I say that, the hairs on my neck are starting to stand up. <laughs> I'm starting to get the chills because you know, who doesn't like a creepy ghost kid story? And they thrived in it. And we know all about this because Sydney Dickinson, about 25 years later, after the events of Deeming's trial and his execution, wrote a book. And it was largely about his experiences with his wife, Marianne, but also about their encounters with Frederick Deeming. And it was published in about 1920, just after Sydney had died. Sydney, I think, started off as a sceptic, but probably to keep the peace in the house, in their home, and also because he just absolutely was devoted to his wife, Mary, and that was his second wife. His first wife had died during childbirth back in the 1870s, and I think he just felt himself so blessed and so fortunate to have such a strong woman as his wife that he fell under a spell, and he earnestly believed that what she saw was real, and he claimed that, you know, at night, the ghost of Deeming's mother had visited their home several times and haunted his wife. The climax of this whole story was when the ghost of Deeming, following his execution, turned up at their home and began knocking on the front door. Deeming had contracted syphilis overseas some years before his death. Do you think that that could explain what was happening to him in his final years? Could that have affected his brain or potentially his personality? Oh, look, undoubtedly, he showed quite a few symptoms of what they now call neurosyphilis. He had a mental illness. There's no doubt about that long before those events. Back in 1878, he had jumped on a ship not long after his mother's death and uh, gone to India. And he'd had to be admitted to the Calcutta General Hospital. And he spent three or four months in there suffering repeated epileptic attacks. He'd go unconscious for days at a time. They had to strap him down on the bed. And when he was finally released and the British embassy put him on a ship to send him back home, his brothers back home said there was a significant change in his personality. Uh, he would talk to himself, laugh at his own jokes, mumble away. Hardly the catch you would have thought for his first wife because she married him three years later. But there was no doubt that he was suffering from something even back then. But no doubt, he claims to have uh, contracted syphilis from a prostitute in South Africa and told doctors who had examined him, and they saw the scars from it. They firmly believed that he was indeed suffering from the disease. He told them that he'd gone in search of the prostitute who'd given it to him several times, armed with a gun or a knife, trying to exact revenge, but he could never find her. I guess that's the other thing that sort of raises its head in the, the whole Jack the Ripper case is his syphilitic disease that he was suffering from and whether or not that had been one of the motivating factors behind his killings as well. That's what I was going to ask, if that was potentially the motive for him murdering Marie and Emily. I think it could have been one of the things, and certainly his wife would have known about it. He told doctors that he told his first wife that he had syphilis. Despite that, they apparently continued sleeping together because she fell pregnant with their fourth child, on their way to South Africa and they ended up naming the little boy Sydney after the city that they just sort of run away from. Mm. It's quite extraordinary when you think about here is a man who is addicted to women and in the 19th century he was addicted to the concept of marriage as well. He just wanted to keep marrying women all the time. But the fact that he could actually in cold blood slit the throats, not just of his wife, but his four children and strangle them as well, and then bury them under the floor of the kitchen of this rented villa, it takes your breath away. And I think it was the savagery and the ferocity of those attacks and the attack on his second wife or third wife, really, another wife in Melbourne, that really dumbfounded so many people. You know, he's a monster, obviously, but killing kids, it's also, you know, just sort of magnifies it even to a greater extent. I think that's probably one of the reasons why people decided to forget about him because I was never taught about Frederick Deeming in school. You probably weren't. I'd never heard his name before this. Yeah, and most of the people listening to this have probably never heard about him before. And yet in 1892 in Australia, his name was the most infamous name in the country and around the world at that time. 
and then you just click your fingers, he disappears, he vanishes. And you would have thought that we would know more about it because, you know, this is a trial in its own right and a, there was a national manhunt for him right around Australia. They were using the newfangled contraption, the telegraph, to get in touch with the police in WA so they could track him down at that small mining town. You know, Australia was riveted by the trial and the capture of him and his execution on the day that he was hanged in Melbourne jail on the morning. It was a bitterly cold morning in May, but there were said to be more than 10,000 people gathered in the streets outside, just waiting for news and to applaud the fact that the rope had finally been put around his neck. The horrific nature of the crimes even shocked what was even then. It was a society that Victorian society had a lot of social mores and uh, rules around how you should behave. And the fact that he was so savage and so brutal, I think, was something that just transfixed the world, the Western world anyway. Finally, I wanted to ask you, do you think that he was Jack the Ripper after looking at all this research and some of the connections? Where do you land? It would be a good thing for me, wouldn't it, if I was promoting a book and saying, yes, I definitely think he was Jack the Ripper. But I can't honestly do that and put my hand on my heart and say, I think he was definitely Jack the Ripper. I think there is enough evidence around that should catapult him into the top three or five suspects for that. And, look, hey, there's been over 100 suspects on Jack the Ripper over the years, some ridiculous ones, including, you know, Queen Victoria's private secretary, you know, right through to local doctors. But there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that he may have had a hand in at least, you know, two or three of them. He certainly sort of used to hint to people when he was in prison at various times and to his lawyers that he had done a great deal of horrible, horrible things over the years, things that would, in his words, he said, would make the world stand up and take notice of me. But he never quite fessed up. While he was in jail awaiting his execution, he penned his own autobiography. And because he had no money left, the plan was that he would give the autobiography to his lawyer, who would then sell it. And they'd sell it for three or five thousand pounds, which was an enormous sum back in those days. And that's how he would repay his legal team. But the Victorian colonial government seized it. They looked through it and decided it was so horrific that they would burn it. Now, I think if he had have made a full confession to the Jack the Ripper killings, it would have been in that autobiography. Mm. And they would then have forwarded it to the London police as part of their case file. So they didn't do that. So we'll never quite know what was in that autobiography. The man was an inveterate liar as well, a compulsive liar. So, you know, you have to try and sift through the truth and where it could lie with him. I think there's enough to say we should take him very seriously as the Jack the Ripper. But you know what? The murders that he did commit and that we know for sure that he did commit were just as horrific as those crimes committed by the real Jack the Ripper. Mm, Absolutely. And it's just incredible that so many of us haven't heard of him before. Yeah, I also think there's also that element of the spiritualism and the ghosts because we live in a society now that, you know, there's still a lot of people who believe in an afterlife. You only have to look at the success of some of those famous American psychics who tour the world making tens of millions of dollars every year. It still lingers. It's still there. And, you know, a lot of us would probably love to think that there is something there beyond But I think the rational side of a lot of us says perhaps there's not, not in the way that they envisaged back in the in the 19th century anyway. But I just found it such a captivating story. I mean, I I love a great ghost story anyway, and I love a good crime thriller too. And this sort of story just combines all of those elements. And when people have written about Frederick Deeming in the past, they've shied away from the spiritualism side because I think they felt it's just a stretch too far. But I just thought, well, hey, you've got the correspondent for the New York Times and his wife who believe they've seen the ghost of Frederick Deeming and his dead mother. That's good enough for me. Gary Linnell is one of Australia's most experienced journalists with several writing awards to his name, including a Walkley for Best Feature Writing. He's been editor-in-chief of The Bulletin, editor of The Daily Telegraph, director of News and Current Affairs for The Nine Network, and editorial director of Fairfax. Gary is the author of five non-fiction books, including The Devil's Work, which examines the life and crimes of Frederick Deeming. You can find a link to it in our show notes. 
True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you've enjoyed today's episode, then let us know. Leave us a rating in your Apple Podcasts app or you can join our True Crime Conversations Facebook page to discuss the episodes with other listeners. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can find me on Mamma Mia Out Loud three times a week as well as Cancelled, all about who's in, who's out and who cares in the world of celebrities.